What's the difference between covenant and contract? Why does God stress family so much in our relationship with him? And how do we continue on in the midst of pain in the church? Welcome back to The Quiet Reformation. I'm Justin, and congratulations. If you have started at the beginning, you are over the halfway mark. You deserve a participation medal or sticker or badge. In this first season of the podcast, we are doing many episodes and smashing together clips from our video equipping class called On Ligaments and Manifolds. We've had multiple in-person teaching sessions of this series with different Christian pastors and leaders from a spectrum of the believing church. If you've been part of those, hopefully this season will jiggity jog your memory of some of those key aspects. And if you're just getting to know Netzer, this season will help to lay a foundation for how we sense God reforming his church in our day. We continue the train of thought today, recognizing that through the redemptive work of Christ, we, the church, are made one through the new covenant in his blood. And yet, as good as the covenant we enjoy in Christ is, There is still brokenness we have to deal with, and we can't escape it. The gospel must be between us. We can't love the Father and hate the family. From the Gospel of John, chapter 6, as Jesus is talking about him being the bread of life, about receiving and believing in him, John writes this, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I'm going to continue on the theme of marriage. You know, Jen and I, we stood at an altar and we recited vows to one another in our marriage ceremony. And when we were doing that, we were basically saying, you know, no matter what comes, whether we have money or not, whether we're sick or, or whether we're healthy, you know, we're going to go through all these times, but we're going to love one another and stick together. We're in it. We're now one. And the difference between what our relationship was after that promise versus before that promise is that before that promise, there's still very much the understood option to kind of step out of the relationship if things aren't to your liking. But once you make that decision, that's a covenant, that's a commitment that in the eyes of God, we are now made one. And so oneness isn't something that we try to achieve. It's not something that we attain to or strive for. Oneness is something that just is because of the covenant relationship. Unity, on the other hand, is something that we work toward. Unity is something that kind of ebbs and flows. Unity is about whether we're on the same page. It's about whether Jen and I think we should spend our money the same way, or Jen and I think that we should raise kids the same way. It's about all the different decisions and perspectives that we have to make in the course of a day, a week, a month, or a lifetime, and that we're working to become more and more on the same page, to be unified. And the journey of a covenant relationship is the journey of learning to become more unified. There's an important point to make here, and that's that a covenant relationship is the kind of relationship that necessitates 
unity, that we're, we're wise if we come to a place of unity inside of a covenant relationship. Because if we've decided to be one, but then we act in disunity, it only hurts us, right? Because it's like two parts of my body disagreeing about what should happen. But there's other kinds of relationships too. Like when you go and sign an employee-employer contract, you know you'll get paid a certain amount if you do what your employer wants you to do. If he's not paying you enough, you're probably not going to show up and work. If you're not working hard enough, then he might or she might let go of you as an employee. That's different than when you enter a deep covenantal relational commitment to one another. We cannot have a relationship with the Father without having a relationship with the family. There is no covenant there where we get adopted by the Father, but we're not a part of his family. That's what it means to be adopted by the Father, is that we are also a part of his family. That means that that person in the church down the street who also gave their life to God through Jesus, that I'm one with them. And they might be a little bit different than me. And they might see things differently, but that's the beauty of the body of Christ. Because you know and I know that when we enter into a family, families aren't perfect by any means. Even a good family has all sorts of tension in it. But see, a family unit is put in place in some ways for the very purpose of us learning to mature and grow in the midst of our differences. That means that when my sister sees things this way, and my brother sees things this way, and I want things this way, and we all disagree that in the family unit, we're already one. We're still under the same roof, and we still have to figure it out together. And in that context, in that covenant relationship, we have to learn to work it out. And that's what the church is. That's what we're called into. Not only into a reconciled relationship with God, but a reconciled relationship with one another. We have to learn to submit to the reality that we are one in order to become unified. And I want to remind us that when we enter into that covenant with Christ, we are automatically entered into the covenant with one another. And we didn't get there by being right. We got there by admitting that we're never going to get it all right, that Jesus has it right. If we're still one in Christ, but there's division or there's hurt or there's pain or there's brokenness. What do we do with that? And fortunately, salvation, the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection, it speaks not only to our own sin, but it speaks to the sin between each other as well. When we've been hurt, when the relationships between us have been hurt and there's been brokenness, there's been a tear or there's been some sort of wound, if the reaction to that wound goes too far, if we build up scar tissue, then it doesn't allow the ligaments to to work right. And there isn't a smooth functioning between us. And that's why it's very important that that stuff gets resolved. Anybody who's listening to this, who's been connected to the church, I'm sure you have been hurt in the church and even by the church. Because we're still human, we're still broken, just like people in a family get hurt by the family. And that doesn't mean that we should walk away. It doesn't mean that it should be over. In the relationship with Jesus, as he calls us into a covenant relationship with himself, that's an eternal covenant. And we also are bound in an eternal covenant. And that's why in, in uh, this whole understanding of what it means to be one, we have to come to terms with the reality that when we are in a church situation and things get a little messy and when they get difficult, Part of the reason that we've been brought into a covenant relationship is so that we learn to work through that together. The way that uh, in a marriage, we need to learn to work through difficulties. And so often right now, we uh, in the church have kind of consumer contracts, right? Where we go to a church because this is what I feel like I need. Just like those people in John 6, they, they wanted the food. And to the extent that they weren't getting what they want or it was getting weird or getting hard, they just bounced. And so often in churches right now, when people aren't getting things, you know, things are getting weird or they're a little more difficult or whatever, instead of having that covenantal mindset of we're one in Christ and we have to work this out, it's easy to just move on, particularly if I've been hurt. And so Jesus models for us what we do with hurt. 
There's so much power in the ability to forgive. So much so that when Jesus is put on the cross, the first words that he speaks from the cross, the very first thing he says when he's hanging on that cross is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we see Stephen, when he's being stoned, modeling that same thing that Jesus has taught him. Forgiveness. Some would argue that the greatest power on earth, that the most miraculous power that has ever touched the cosmos is the power of forgiveness because that is what Jesus is doing on the cross. And it's forgiveness that allows for reconciliation, for relationships to be restored. Because if God's salvation is working not only to restore me to a relationship with him, but to restore us to relationship with each other, then this gospel has to be powerful enough to not only reconcile us with him, but with one another. When we get to the place where we are able to live in a relationship that's whole with God, and where we can learn how to process pain, then there's healing that starts to happen in the body of Christ. And we are getting closer to getting back to what it means to be a covenant called out people of God who reveal the very image and nature of God, who reveal the very image and nature of God, who reveal the very image and nature of God. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is DJ Martin. I serve as the church pastor at Park Ford Church in the Pottstown area. I've been hugely blessed by Netzer's ministry over the past decade as I've served in vocational ministry in various settings, particularly since I've been leading a couple of different churches as lead pastor. Netzer has been a place where I've built community and relationships. Uh, Netzer has a focus on church for church leaders that has had a huge impact on my life and ministry, especially through their cohort ministry. I help lead the local cohort here in the Pottstown area and the relationships and connections, friendships I've built over the years and have been built for me through the cohort ministry have been amazing. And I've certainly grown and been strengthened and challenged by these relationships over the years. We all know how isolating and difficult ministry can be at times. And Netzer's emphasis and focus on church for church leaders has been a source of strength and encouragement for me. I hope that you get involved in Netzer in whatever ways you can in the coming season of ministry in your own life. If you're sticking with us in the podcast, please be sure to share it with others in your community circles. But more than that, we would encourage you to seek out conversations and connections with the broader body of Christ about these things we're talking about. At Netzer, we believe biblical teaching and redemptive imagination are key, but if those things aren't fleshed out, aren't embodied, and worked through in relationships, we're going to come to a dead end pretty fast. If you're in southeastern PA, and don't know where to start, shoot us an email, connect at netzer.org, and we'll see how we can help. From Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Mm -hmm.